You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 19, sonnet 18. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? During the course of this last week, I've managed to put a little more effort into the book. And one thing I've noticed that I'd like to share with my listeners comes from the opening of Sonnet 5. Sonnet 5 opens with the words, those hours. And while today the word hours holds a particular meaning of the fixed quantity of time, it was originally very flexible and was used to describe periods of time, traditionally seasons and even years. It is likely that here the intended meaning is seasons or years, with additional reference being made to the figures surrounding Phoebus in his palace, the Greek Hore, which numerically and metaphorically leave us with a lot to consider. There are also three triads of the Hore, life and growth, law and order, abundance and prosperity, all themes established in the sonnet sequence. These three triads, being three times three, might also explain the significance of the number nine in the sequence, which is mentioned in the previous episode's discussion of climacteric numbers. It is also possible that the climacteric seven might be derived from the three hore combined with the four seasons. Subsequently, while fooling around with the arithmetic from sonnet six, I realized that there are 154 sonnets, which can be separated into 10 and 144 respectively. 144 is 12 times 12. The number of hours in the day. Am I reaching? Possibly, but I think it's worth a little investigation. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, ten times that dollar will bring you the finished product ten times faster. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 18. Just like its predecessor, Sonnet 18 is a communication primarily between the sonnet and its creator. Whether it is the sonnet or Shakespeare himself being compared to a summer's day, the sonnets that capture Shakespeare's youth will retain their potency as long as readers have eyes to read them and breath to speak them, while Shakespeare will earn immunity from old age and death as long as they continue to capture our imaginations as they have captured his soul. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. The first word that needs to be examined here is temperate, meanings of self-restrained, not swayed by passion, and not liable to excessive heat or cold may be clear, but the origin of the word is temper, which might reference Latin's tempus, meaning time or season, but of particular usefulness relates to regulation in line with the legal theme and tuning the pitch of a musical instrument which continues the musical theme. Before the 18th century, winds would have been pronounced more like wines, rhyming with kinds, and as early as the 15th century would have been loaded with additional meanings. The first would be breath, in speaking in particular, which ties into the reader's breathing of the sonnets being responsible for sounding the music of the words and for the shaking of the buds, and the second moving by turning and twisting, relating to wandering relating to the word wanderist in the third quatrain and the wandering bark of sonnet 116. To add to that, the words wind, winds, or windy only appear five times in the sequence, in sonnets 14, 18, 51, 90, and 117, and at least three of those times in the context of traveling. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair some time declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. The eye of heaven is the sun, and recalls the eye in heaven from sonnet 14. 
The opening lines of this quatrain provide the reader with examples demonstrating the inconsistency of the sun's warmth. I strongly suspect that the eye of heaven is a reference to the all-seeing eye, the eye of Horus, which is referenced both in Greek mythology in the hymns of Orpheus and in Christianity in the forms of eye of providence or eye of God. Complexion originally meant temperament and natural disposition of body or mind. In Middle English, the meaning derived from then contemporary medicine was bodily constitution or general nature resulting from blending of the four primary qualities, hot, cold, dry, moist, or humors, blood, phlegm, color, black color. This is not the first time in the past week that I've been inspired to connect the sonnets to the study of alchemy. Initially, I considered this when reviewing the distillation theme of Sonnet 5 and the refiguring of Sonnet 6. According to the Islamic alchemist Jabir, lead was cold and dry, while gold was hot and moist. So an alchemical sense of gold complexion would fit the context of Sonnet 18 quite nicely. Fair, as discussed previously, can be read as beauty, as just, as passage, and as make. Declines, derived from Old French, meaning to sink, decline, degenerate, turn aside, and to deviate. Two of those terms can refer to the sonnet sailing the ocean of eternity. Decline's modern sense of to refuse or not consent only appears to have come into use a decade or two after the sonnets were published, so I doubt that those are relevant. Course generally referred to an order, sequence, or line in which something moves. From the late 14th century, courses was used for the flow of bodily fluids and humors, which relates back to the gold complexion. Trim, by the late 16th century, was an evocative nautical term that meant to be firm, solid, steadfast, and to stabilize, to distribute the load of a ship so she floats on an even keel, as well as the non-nautical term for decorate or adorn. To reread the second quatrain with all of this in mind, the sun, the sun god, or Shakespeare, with time varies in his presence and in his qualities. Eventually beauty ages, fair becomes unfair, what is made is unmade, the sun sets, and ships sink or sail off course. Whether by luck or design, possibly by a change in the sonnet sequence, or its undirected voyage into the unknown. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Owest is usually explained as both o and own, but it's the first meaning that I'm inclined to buy into as it follows the theme of usury or money lending. That fair thou owest can also be understood as the cost of passage that you owe. The beauty that Shakespeare has invested in the sonnets will remain in his possession in the form of the sonnets, just as the beauty that the sonnets impart to the reader will remain theirs. In this regard, the sonnets owe their beauty both to Shakespeare and to the reader, whereas Shakespeare owes it to himself and his son's memory to share it with the world. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. I find it intriguing that in the Arden sonnets, Catherine Duncan Jones states that the word growest may seem inapplicable to poetry, where it is my understanding that Shakespeare's sonnets do grow in time, both while Shakespeare is writing them and in the sense that their spirit matures to self-awareness as the sequence progresses. It is possible, too, that the intention of growing was for the sonnets to increase in popularity and to continue to be published. These two lines evoke a wonderful image of Father Time, in spite of his propensity to relegate the dead to history, marching on accompanied by the ever-living poet embedded in the sonnet sequence. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. The general meaning of the closing couplet of this famous sonnet is well understood. But now that we have a much more nuanced understanding of the sonnet's intent, we can see, four centuries later, that Shakespeare's sonnets have succeeded in their mission. We may not be reading them correctly, and we may even be sullying the reputation of the greatest figure in the history of literature, but their words continue to penetrate our hearts and escape our lips. 
The bard lives on, hiding in the ink trenches of the pages of the sonnets, and imprinted on the hearts and in the minds of their readers. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? surrender.